want to delve into this. This is something we talked about the other day, and this is so obvious. This is um, something that we have talked about so many times, and yet I am more and more aware of this idea, and that is that the idea of living in a thinking universe Wallace D. Waddles talks about this. He's not the only one. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy talked about this. Uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, Neville, Wayne Dyer. The idea is basically that we are like fish in a bowl and a fish is surrounded by water, but a fish doesn't know it's surrounded by water. It just knows it's in the bowl or it just doesn't even know that it's just surrounded by water. Just like most of us are surrounded by air and most of us don't think, okay, well I'm surrounded by air as opposed to water. That stuff around us is alive. The It's been called the ether. And even though there has been no evidence to support that there is an actual ether, there definitely seems to be a vibration of energy that goes between every entity, both animate and inanimate. And Everything is ultimately alive. A rock is ultimately alive because it's made out of living atoms and living molecules. I saw something uh, the other morning uh, on Reddit, and it was an electron microscope. Someone had taken an electron microscope and had zoomed in <clears throat> on a white blood cell that was attempting to catch and kill a bacterium cell. And it really looked like a video game. The bacteria would zip all around just like something out of Galaga and the much larger white blood cell, which can you imagine how small the bacteria is? If the white blood cell is like 10 times, it looked like a Hydra was going after this bacteria and the bacteria would zip to the left or zip to the right. And you would see the white blood cell going like, uh-uh, uh-uh, coming to get you. Uh-uh, uh-uh, can't come over this way. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, I got you over here. I'm going to cut you off. Now, think about that going on in your body trillions of times right now. There is stuff inside you and on you that is alive so why would the stuff outside of you and me not also be alive? Why would there not be this vibratory energy in everything? The thing we need to get is that this energy, just like the white blood cell and even the bacteria, have consciousness. The universe has consciousness. The universe itself, what we are surrounded by. And when I say the universe, I don't mean the, you know, the specific galaxy or anything like that, that the earth finds itself in. I'm talking about everything. The universe has been used as another word for God, but I'm talking about it more as just literally every molecule everywhere on this planet and off this planet. So the molecules are alive. We are alive. We think. We have the ability to think better than any other entity that has ever lived and probably, well, computers will probably outdo us, but the way human beings think is really amazing. I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was like, people want to use this idea of a human mind as a computer and it's really not. Because a computer approaches something over and over and over again the same way. It knows how to handle this or whatever, and it applies it. Whereas the mind can discern subtle shifts and literally begins to think in a different way. 
Our minds are supremely powerful. When we hold thoughts in our minds, they attune with the thinking universe. Take that in for a second. There are people walking by. That's why Teddy's barking. We live in a thinking universe. We ourselves think, and the energy is then conveyed to the universe by the thoughts that we think. I was raised to think that I was bad, that I was no good, <clears throat> that I couldn't do things, that things were going to go wrong no matter what I tried. And that became my thought pattern and that became my reality. It took me years to realize the difficulty of needing to think differently than the way things are. Focusing on the way things are and making that our thought is only going to perpetuate the way things are. My friend uh, Joe Vitale talks about, I saw him in an interview, and he talks about this idea that if we begin to take responsibility for everything in our lives, all the bad stuff too, without blame, but just responsibility. Blame means you shouldn't have. Responsibility means you did. <laughs> If we begin to take responsibility and realize that in our minds, our thoughts got us there, our seeing ourselves in that situation, our feeling that we belong in that situation, that that's the way it's going to be or that it's not going to work out. I know a lot of people who have created vision boards, et cetera. I've got my Amazon device right here flashes images of places I want to go and things I want to do. Like I've never been to the Taj Mahal. I've never been to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem or uh, seen the Northern Lights. And these things, like right now, it's showing me the Greek Isles, showing uh, somebody, uh, showing a beautiful view of uh, the Greek Isles. All of this to remind me of where it is I want to go. Now, the challenge is that most people who put together their vision boards and set their goals is that inside they suddenly believe they can't do it. They can't do it. The purpose of setting your, setting your goals down is not to put the universe into motion. It's not to get God to show up and give you what it is you say you want in that moment. The purpose is to attune yourself to the energy of what it is you want such that it is a fait accompli and you are absolutely going to draw what it is you want to you. And as soon, Wallace Waddles talks about this in The Science of Getting Rich, as soon as you focus this in your mind, as soon as you make this your uh, mental target, that you are going to be attuned with what you want rather than what you don't want, you immediately begin to bring it to you. This is why worry is so bad. Worry, as my friend Joe Vitale says, is negative goal setting. You are literally more likely to bring to you what it is that you are worried about if you are focusing on it and vibrating with it trying to turn my coffee mug off. What we need to do is to begin to vibrate with what we want rather than to vibrate emotionally with what we don't want. I have so many stories of this happening. I've told you the story about meeting my Angelo. This is how I met, um, my, um, how I met, uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, it's how I found my book agent. It's so many things in my life. And yet I forget it too. I think, boy, I would like, which means want, which means don't have so many times. And so what I'm conveying is don't have, don't have, don't have, don't have. I may desire something else, but when I am wanting it, I am affirming that I don't have it. And what we have to do is to begin to pretend as if we already have it. Like I said, this is how I met Oprah. This is how I met Maya Angelou. My favorite story about this, and it's 100% true. I've told it before, but I'm going to tell it again because I still can't believe it. When I was 16, I had a parrot named Boris. And Boris would ride along on my right shoulder. 
Well, one day we were outside and I had not trimmed Boris's wings in a while, which that just means you trim their primary flight, flight feathers. You don't cut their wings or anything. It's like a person getting a haircut, I think. It's been so long I can't remember. Anyway, Boris's wings were a little too long. The wind caught him and uh, he was able to flap his wings and the wind was really strong and it just took him up because of the, the way a bird's wing is defined, designed. Uh, it's going to go up and that's what happened. So he went up into the tree and then the wind blew again and he flew to another tree. I was supposed to be in school. I was 17. I guess I was a junior in high school and I just went back and called the school and said I was going to sit there. Well, I did. I sat there and just wondered how in the world I was going to get this bird down. He was too tall for a cherry picker to get up there and I knew that if anything tried, He'd fly away again. Well, a few hours went by and ultimately the wind blew really, really strongly and he flew away and I never saw him again. Fast forward 12 years and I've got another parrot. Her name is Juggles. I've had her for a long time. She used to go out with me while I juggle because juggling was a hobby of mine back then, which reminds me, I've got to take my juggling balls to the Western State Fair Association when I go. That's going to be fun. I'm planning to juggle on stage. So she and I are there. We're in Seattle, Washington. Same thing happens. Wind blows, bird goes flying up into the air, spins around a few times, and this time goes in a tree. And I said, I've been here before. And I said, I'm going to apply the power of all this positive thinking I've been hearing about and visualization, and I'm going to believe I'm going to get this bird back. Now, what's interesting is I'd met several people who had had birds do the same thing my first one did. Caught, caught, caught a draft and took off and that was that. No one ever got their birds back. I saw a woman one time who had a bird who was up in a dogwood tree that couldn't have been more than 10 feet tall. But by the time she got up to it with a ladder, the bird went higher. The birds always go higher. That's the challenge, especially if they've never flown before because they don't know how to land. Well, I'm sitting there and I've just decided I'm going to get the bird back. And I immediately closed my eyes and visualized her back on my shoulder. I just did that. And then I decided I was going to stay there and visualize that until she came back. I called my job. I was working at KSEA, KSEA FM in Seattle. And I told them I wasn't coming in until, and they said, when? I said, I don't know. I didn't call my mom. Because I knew my mom would say, oh, I'm so sorry for your darling. Oh, oh. You see where I get that in my head? <laughs> so I just didn't tell her. But I sat there and I visualized, I visualized, I visualized. I spent nights in the park. I slept on a blanket. Luckily, it was nice in Seattle. It was summertime. And there was a young man who kept coming through the park and he would see me and he, and I would tell him about the parrot and he would see it. And he said, how long has it been up there? And we would talk. And I had a sign that said $100 reward, anyone helping me or find this bird or catch the bird. And so it was right next to me. And we talked about that. We talked, I said, but I'm getting this bird back. It's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. Well, after a week, Exact same thing happens. Strong windstorm blows the bird up into the air. The bird just circles a few times and takes off gone. And I could tell he was gone. We're up on top of Magnolia Hill in Seattle. So I'm still not going to give up. I go back to my condo and, and I tell my wife, I said, he's going to come back. She's going to come back. It's going to work out. This is okay etc, etc, etc. And that night I slept and I dreamt that I was lying in the park and she flew overhead and I reached into the air and grabbed her out of the air. Now, mind you, this was atypical for me. Okay. In the past, I would have gone, oh no, she's gone and called everybody. I didn't want any of that negative energy in the universe. I didn't want to put fear into a thinking universe. I only wanted to put faith into a thinking universe. So what happened? A couple of days later, I get a phone call and it's from the Humane Society. 
And it's on the other side of Seattle and they have a parrot. Someone had turned in a parrot and there was a sign. Someone had seen a sign. So someone 10 miles away had seen a sign I had put up right next door and had caught the parrot. So I ended up going, it's a long story. I won't go into all of that, but we got her back. We did. It was my bird. But then I asked How did it happen? And come to find out, the young man who had been hanging out with me in the park, you ready for this? Had gone home the very night that she had flown away and was on the phone just catching up with a friend. And his buddy said, what you been doing today? He says, oh, I was hanging in the park with this guy who had a parrot that flew up in a tree. And the buddy, he says, what are you doing? And the buddy said, oh, I'm watching a thing on parrots and what they eat right now. All right. This was before there was 6,000 television channels. This was 1990. So he's watching a thing on parrots. This guy was in the park with me. And he's watching what parrots eat. And he says, what do they eat? And he says, sunflower seeds. And the guy says, you know, it's funny. I just bought some sunflower seeds. And so they're sitting there talking and the guy looks out his back window and says, what kind of parrot or what did it look like? And the guy described small green yellow head and he goes, that parrot is on my fence right now. I'm not making any of this up, y'all. This is all 100% true. I refuse to believe that she was going to be gone. I charged the thinking universe with faith. I only believed, I visualized seeing her again, holding her again, because she liked to nuzzle up against my chest. I visualized, 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 and I would not allow the other, the opposite, her not coming back, et cetera, to come to me. So the guy is on the phone with his friend who is watching a thing on parrots and what they eat. What the guy does very smartly is he doesn't go anywhere near juggles. He starts about 10 feet away and puts about every foot a sunflower seed. Now, she has not eaten that I know of in a week, so she's very hungry. And he puts a box at the end and puts a little pile of sunflower seeds in the box on the side, on its side. And then he just waits and she makes her way along the top of the fence, goes in the box. And when she does, he sneaks out, turns the box straight up and covers it with a towel. And to this day, my favorite way of ending that story is how the hell did that happen? How did that happen? How did the guy that I'm talking to talk to a friend who's 10 miles away and my bird flies out of millions of homes in Seattle and lands on his fence? I'll tell you how it happened. I made it happen by holding those thoughts in my head. And I always have that power. And so do you. The problem is we mix that with worry, with doubt, with fear. The same was true when I was going to meet Maya Angelou and give her the six millionth bracelet. So many people tried to tell me why it wasn't going to happen. And I was just like, it's going to happen. And it happened. You have this power because you live in a thinking universe. It's not like I'm so powerful. You're not like a Marvel super character. You are a homo sapien with the prefrontal cortex that can think about the future. And when you do, whether it's fear and worry or whether it's excitement and gratitude, you're going to draw it to you. So what are you sending out there today? Can you begin to imagine that you already have what you already have? I was looking at getting a car and I've got a very expensive car in mind. And for the last couple of years, the timing just wasn't right. And then the timing was right, but the cars aren't available um, for a year, which is fine, which is totally fine. I can wait. I've waited for a while for this particular car and I love my old car. And yet what I do, one of the things that I do is when I sit down to meditate, I visualize myself coming around the corner of the parking area and seeing my car, seeing my new car and feeling the feeling of what it's going to be like of pressing the button and opening the doors and putting Teddy in to his little car seat and all of that. And the smell, getting in there and smelling it. If you can do all of that, if you can 
sensorially own, that was, means with your five senses, now what it is you want in the future, it will scamper to you. It will come running to you. It's funny, I hadn't, um, I hadn't seen anybody I was the least bit really seen anybody I was interested in on the dating app in a while. And I was starting to get a little disappointed every time I opened the app. I'd be like, oh, I'm not going to see anybody that's interested or inter I'm interested or whatever, you know, negative talk. And then I went, wait a minute, that's exactly opposite. My app is going to be blown up with beautiful, interesting women that are very interested in meeting me, et cetera. And I, I did that. And the next time I checked, I had like three people that were really wonderful individuals. It works, y'all. You're doing this already. You need to begin to realize, though, that you live in a thinking universe and to begin to think in harmony with what you want and not what you don't want. All right. Since I said not what you don't want, this is your chance to click share and type shared in the comments section. I'm going to pull up a song for us to do as our song of the day. Have not done it in a while, I realized. The problem is I put all of these in here that Ed provided me. Here we go. Is this it? Yes. All right. Here is the song of the day from Ed. Cover Me in Sunshine by Pink, who I like very much, and Willow Sage Heart. So, Cover Me in Sunshine. That's our song of the day. By the way, the easiest and the fastest way to get what you want is gratitude, 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 gratitude. Even being grateful for what you have. When my uh, wrist was giving me such a fit with arthritis and tendonitis and Johnny Unitis and every other kind of itis, you know, I just had to sit there and imagine what it would be like when it was no longer bothering me and to be there and to accept that. No more, no more complaining people, their lives are changing, we're flying high, creating a complaint-free world. No more, no more complaining people, their lives are changing. Flying high